Hello and welcome, welcome everybody to this lecture about Swedish weapon export industry. We are here from Amnesty International Umeå University at the Volksuniversitetet in Umeå and I'm also welcome our speaker and export Linder Åkesson in Stockholm from Svenska Frit and she will talk about her topic, uh, the Swedish weapon armor industry and export. So I give the ball to Linda now. Presentation now. So that was just a film um, that was from my visit to the IDEX Arms Fair in Abu Dhabi 2019. Uh, and IDEX stands for International Defense Exhibition and Conference, and it's uh, the Middle East and North Africa's uh, biggest arms fair held every other year in Abu Dhabi. And I just wanted to show you this film just to set the scene, or one scene at least, uh, of Swedish arms trade and international arms trade. And um, even though the arms trade industry is special in many ways, it's also about sales and marketing just like uh, any other business, uh, pretty much. Uh, so in this film you could also see the Swedish company Saab, uh, and I will come back to Saab in a little while. And um, there are much more information about this arms fair in my visit to the arms fair, if you're interested. Uh, I think there will be links in the comment sections uh, for you to read more. But before um, I move into this, in this topic of Swedish arms trade, I wanted to tell you a bit about the organization where I work, the Swedish Peace and Arbitration Society. Uh, we were founded uh, in 1883, which makes us uh, the world's oldest now active and Swedish biggest peace organization. And in order to create or achieve our vision of sustainable peace, uh, we think that we need to start with our ourselves advocating and campaigning uh, against political decisions that uh, put militaristic thinking in the forefront and um, uh, for more peaceful structures and more peaceful political decisions in every step. And um, the, the Swedish arms trade is, of course, one major obstacle in this regard. So we've been following the Swedish arms trade since the 1920s and been actively scrutinizing uh, Swedish arms trade policy since the mid-80s. And our founder, Kopi Arnoldsson, um, he was uh, awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1908 for his um, involvement mediating or pushing for, for mediation in the conflict between Sweden and Norway. So Sweden and Norway at that time was in a union and uh, there was a lot of um, was a strong push at that time to, um, to, for military means to be uh, used to hinder Norway from leaving the union. Um, and uh, this sounds unthinkable today, it was a reality at that time. And Kopi Arnoldsson, he, 
he argued that this conflict should be solved through arbitration instead. So that's why we are called Swedish Peace and Arbitration Society. And I think that during this long history, uh, the role of SPAS, Swedish Peace and Arbitration Society, or Svenska Fiat, has often been to kind of uh, counter or stop bad ideas that were rooted in this uh, overly militaristic um, thinking or history, reflex and tradition. And there are lots of examples of this throughout the history uh, where, where we've been involved in different campaigns. And of course, this is also why we are involved in opposing the Swedish arms trade. But before uh, I come into Swedish arms trade, I want, you, I want to just zoom out for a bit. Um, in the world, out of the world's 195 states, 67 produce and export major conventional arms, according to SIFRI, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. And Sweden is, of course, one of these countries. And usually here I, I get uh, the audience to guess who are the biggest exporters and the biggest importers. But uh, this time around, I'll just uh, uh, read the list to you. These were the biggest exporters of um, major conventional arms during this period of time, 2015 to 2019. And um, we have the United States in top, followed by Russia. Um, and these two together, um, they account for 57% of the total arms trade in the world. So that's, that's a two major, major players. And then we have France, Germany, China, and United Kingdom. And among these three six, or the first six, um, we find the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. And this list has been pretty stable um, over time, except for China that has been uh, moving up the list quite um, fast in the last like five or 10 years. On the importer list, these are the biggest importers during the same period of time. Uh, we see Saudi Arabia in top, India, Egypt, Australia, etc. Uh, this list is much more, um, um, this list changes a lot more than the first list, uh, depending on where the conflicts are, where the tensions are, uh, where we see um, the difference, like problematic situations around the world. It also reflects on um, the biggest importers or the importer list. So there are lots of nuances to this, of course, but uh, focusing on the broad pictures here, uh, we can at least say that there are more wealthy democratic states um, uh, who are sometimes involved in armed conflict, but usually not on their own territory in the exporter list. And we have more countries, um, more developing states, undemocratic states, um, countries involved in armed conflict and with armed conflict on their own territories um, on the importer list. So Sweden is um, uh, on the 15th biggest exporter in the world of major conventional arms. As you can see, 0.6% of the total uh, market. And that's it can be a lot or it can be a little, of course, compared to what you compare it to. But uh, compared to size and population, um, it's quite a lot. And there are also a few other countries in the world that have um, uh, put so much effort in consciously creating a very broad arms industry um, that can uh, produce or that have created a capability of producing everything from ammunition uh, to camouflage, communication, to fighter jets, uh, artillery and submarines, etc. So this uh, makes the Swedish arms industry um, very big and very broad compared to Swedish, Sweden's size. So this is um, statistics show a Swedish arms trade over time from 1984 to 2018. Um, and as you can see, there's been a, an, a major increase in exports since about the year in the beginning of the year 2000s. And uh, 
uh, the arms rate is almost quadrupled since the beginning of the 2000, of 2000s. And there are several reasons to this. Uh, one is that, uh, one major is that after the Cold War, the demand of the Swedish armed forces was a lot less. Um, and we had, we had this overdimension um, arms industry um, compared to like, the, uh, the demand of the Swedish armed forces. So there was a, a kind of a gap between the uh, arms industry need to supply and the Swedish armed forces uh, kind of a demand. And this gap was filled and the arms industry was compensated in a way through allowing more arms exports. And you can see this also in the number of buy countries. So in 1990, uh, 33 countries bought Swedish arms. And in the last years, it's been around 60 countries. For example, the, the whole Middle East and North Africa region was opened up, um, increasing, of course, a lot of uh, the number of buy countries. We also have uh, the war on terror in Iraq and Afghanistan that uh, caused like a demand for Swedish arms and other from other countries. Uh, Swedish arms industry developed uh, Swedish arms, especially for uh, these conflicts to for the um, United States military. All, another factor is that Sweden abandoned uh, its neutrality policy in the beginning of the 2000s and um, uh, it made collaboration in security policy um, a priority and a value in itself. Um, so um, the paradox here is that neutrality was kind of both um, the motivation again like behind creating such a broad industry but also as a limiting factor. Um, these were the biggest buyer countries last year. Brazil, United States, United Arab Emirates, Pakistan and India. Um, and over, if you look at a, a, a longer period of time, you can also find bigger, uh, big imported countries such as Hungary, Thailand, Norway, Germany uh, and Czech Republic. Um, but last year, year the, these were the biggest clients. And of course, there, there are a lot of things to say about this list, uh, especially in terms of undemocratic regimes and countries in armed conflicts, uh, especially since Pakistan and India are in armed conflict with each other since a very long time back in history. Um, Saab is uh, by far the biggest arms company in Sweden um, and also the only Swedish arms company that the, the only big Swedish arms company that is still Swedish owned. Um, the other two major arm companies, uh, Bofors and Heglunds, they are now been bought by the um, British um, company BA Systems. They are now BA Systems Bofors and Bayer Systems Heglunds. Other big companies are, are Namo, Norma, and Aimpoint. So um, a very common question uh, to us, to Spas, to me, is um, what are the actual rules and regulations uh, surrounding Swedish arms trade? What are you allowed to do? What are you not allowed to do? Um, so the Swedish uh, regulation arms trade is it uh, consists of three layers. We have one global uh, layer, that is the United uh, Nations Arms Trade Treaty that was uh, uh, came into force in 2015. And then we have the, uh, the regional EU common position from 2008. And then we have the Swedish national legisl uh, legislation and regulation, law and guidelines. Um, and this is the, like, one paragraph of the law uh, the, uh, on uh, arms exports. So it says that uh, a license may only be granted in accordance with this law if there are security and defense policy reasons for doing so 
and provided there is no conflict with Sweden's international commitments or with Sweden for Swedish foreign policy. So this uh, actually doesn't say that much about who you can export to, uh, in what circumstances, what you can export, etc. It it may it it mainly stipulates that there are two uh, there are two major things that are supposed to be taken into consideration here. Uh, and the, these are the security and defense policy reasons, and then you have the commitments to foreign policy, international commitments and foreign policy. Uh, so how this is supposed to be done is uh, developed in the Swedish guidelines. This is a... Um, an attempt to illustrate um, the inherent compromise or dilemma that is um, like on that is um, kind of the essence of Swedish arms trade policy, because um, these guidelines contain highly conflicting interests and values, um, and it's not specified exactly how these conflicting values and interests are supposed to relate to each other in every in each sec in each case and um, how this um, this is supposed to be done through what is called an overall assessment total bedömning in swedish and how this uh, uh, weighing together of these interests is actually done in each case is um, something that we know very little about it's uh, covered by a lot of secrecy and uh, uh, when we try to ask we or uh, journalists or any other uh, person try to ask uh, about this, how it's done, uh, why did we export to country X, etc. Um, the the response is usually or almost always, I, I'd say, uh, that this is something covered by secrecy and that they are not allowed or able to say. So if you look at this overall assessment as a like a kind of scale. Uh, all time scale. Uh, we have the reasons for exporting on the one hand, the defense and security interests. And these are uh, keeping an arms industry with knowledge and capacity in Sweden. So you want to give the arms industry um, possibilities or opportunities to export uh, in order for there to continue to be an arms industry in Sweden. Uh, sometimes you also hear about security of trade flows, and this was um, an argument that came up, for example, when uh, Sweden had made plans to help Saudi Arabia to build a weapons factory in 2012. It's a big scandal in Sweden. It was motivated by, um, by uh, Sweden wanting to secure trade flows going um, through like, close to Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia would be a stability stabilizing force in the uh, region uh, so that the trade flows that were coming to Sweden wouldn't be stopped or hindered in any ways. Um, there are also reasons uh, that are connected to Sweden's willingness to give the arms industry um, good um, opportunities to sell. So this is connected to uh, that the industry wants to offer stability um, arms um, deals are often very big, both in terms of value, but also over time. So uh, as an arms company, you would want to say that you can, we, can, we can export to you for a very, very long time, even if uh, something changes in your country or in Sweden in regards to pol pol change policy or something like that. So this has resulted in something called follow-on deliveries. And follow-on deliveries, um, if a deal is classified as a follow-on delivery, um, it means that, um, it means that um, it's connected to, to a deal that's already been approved in some way. It can be uh, being spare parts or ammunition or more systems of the same kind that's, al that's already been exported. And, uh, if it's classified as a follow-on delivery, it's much more likely to be approved, even though there are risks in the buyer uh, in the buyer countries 
that would speak against exporting. And so this is one of the major loopholes in the Swedish regulation that uh, allows for a lot of arms deals that would otherwise, or that, that would look impossible or uh, that looks extremely controversial. They're often motivated by this, um, you know, this classification. Uh, and on the other hand, so the, these are the things that speak for exporting according to the Swedish arms trade policy. And then we have the things that are considered speaking against exporting. And these are the foreign, foreign policy aims. Uh, we have the respect for human rights. Uh, it says that Sweden, uh, a license should not be approved uh, if there's uh, serious and widespread um, serious and widespread violations of human rights. And uh, we are preventing and stopping armed conflict if there is deemed a risk of armed conflict in, uh, if there is an armed conflict going on or if there is a risk for armed conflict. Uh, democratic status was included in the, uh, in the guidelines in 2015. And uh, development is another thing that's mentioned in the, uh, in the guidelines, but it's very a very vague um, wording. You know, we also have things that are not mentioned. Uh, on the pro side, uh, there's no mention of jobs, like exporting in order to create jobs. And there's no mention of exporting uh, for economic reasons. Um, and I'll come back to, to that and why it's so. And on the against side, uh, there's no mention of feminist foreign policy. Uh, which is something that we continually ask uh, Swedish government about. And there's no mention of human security. So um, for um, all students of political science or, or the like that has studied um, the, like the use of security as, as a, an argument, you can see that there's a clear a conflict here between uh, national military security, like the traditional um, definition of security, focusing on the nation state, that could, like protecting the territory. That, th th that is the kind of security that is um, uh, defines the, the um, arguments in to export the pro arguments, but then human security uh, more connected to uh, people, the people security and group security, um, like human rights and um, health, et cetera. Uh, those are kind of the, the security uh, definition, more uh, defining of the arguments against exporting. So we have actually two like, definitions of security that is um, uh, in contrast with each other within this regulation. Um, if I would ask for you to, to bring two things with you uh, uh, from this lecture, uh, it would be um, these two things, two major myths about Swedish arms trade. Uh, there are mo many, many more myths. I would recommend a book uh, called uh, Seven Myths That Support the Global Arms Trade, I think it's called, by Paul Holden. Uh, it's excellent. Um, but these two myths, I think, are very prominent in the Swedish arms trade debate. And the first one is that um, arms trade provides a lot of jobs and money to Sweden. This is something that you hear over and over again, uh, both by people um, like the general public, but also by politicians sometimes in the media debate. Um, and actually, there are not a lot of people working with arms trade in Sweden. Uh, the last figure that I uh, can find, it's from the uh, arms trade lobby organization, SOT. Um, they say that 11,000 people work with arms production in Sweden in 2016. And that is uh, 0 0.2 of all engaged like employed or studying Sysselsatta in Swedish. So that's actually not a lot of people. Uh, 
the Swedish arms trade is uh, approximately 1% of the total export of goods in Sweden. So it's not a very big business compared to other businesses in Sweden. Of course, uh, these 11,000 people spread across the country. There, it's, not, it's not a lot of people, but in certain areas in Sweden, for example, Lin shopping, uh, where Saab has uh, a lot of its production. Um, the arms trade is, of course, a major employer. So for these regions or these places, of course, the arms trade is uh, uh, an important employer, to say the least. But if you look at the country as a whole, it's a different story. The other myths uh, that I counter, oh, just one more thing about the econ economy and jobs. Uh, even though this um, argument is very prominent in the, like, the media debate, it's not very uh, common to hear it if you look at, like, the, if you meet with politicians that are very, that know arms trade well, and um, that uh, if you look through the serious, like, actual political um, proposals that have been made, this is not something that is argued for. And I think that it's because um, mo most people who know something about arms trade know also about these facts and that uh, if the aim would be to support um, uh, like to create better economic situation for Sweden or create jobs there are a lot of better businesses to invest in in order to do that uh, there is very little um, research into the costs like the benefits and uh, costs of, of Swedish arms trade, but there is uh, quite a lot of uh, good information about British uh, costs and benefits, if you can call it that. So if you are interested in this, I'd look up uh, more about the British situation, and some of that can be related back to Sweden, I think. Um, if you would, if you want, if you would want to look at this issue in a serious manner, you would have to look both at tax revenues, revenues uh, because these are private companies. This is also a, a, a myth, kind of a misunderstanding uh, that, uh, that, that it's Sweden is actually getting the money from the arms trade. These are um, privately owned companies. So uh, the, the money that uh, they get from, from exporting it it's, um, benefits their taxpayer or their uh, shareholders and not the Swedish state. But if you would want to look at this seriously, you'd have to compare both like the tax revenues from companies, but also um, look at all the ways that the Swedish state is supporting the arms industry in various ways through loans, export credits, for example, but also PR um, involvement, um, for example, by um, ministers uh, and sometimes royal family also going uh, to buyer countries in order to promote Swedish arms trade on behalf of these companies. And this is a very common factor in all arms trade, not only Swedish, but most big companies. The state is very involved. Um, yeah, the second myth is that arms trade makes Sweden independent and neutral. And I think there's a big uh, misunderstanding uh, that Sweden is still a neutral country. I got this uh, question just um, uh, a few weeks ago from uh, from um, young students on in high school making their uh, guess doing like a school project, uh, and they asked me uh, why are we doing this uh, when we are a neutral country? And I said we are not longer a neutral country. And they said, what is your source on that? And the fact is that Sweden has not had the, any ambition to be a, a neutral country since the beginning of the two, 2000s. So uh, this is a major shift in Swedish security policy that also affected arms trade in many ways. Uh, there's no, uh, no longer any ambition or no goal to, um, to uh, declare Sweden neutral if there would be a conflict in the way that it used to be. Uh, so th that's that's one reason why not to uh, talk about neutrality. 
uh, we can also talk about independence. I think it's no, it's not, it's, I think it's always been very difficult to claim that, um, that arms trading, especially with, arm, with countries in, involved in armed conflict or with other countries, because arms trade is not only a trade in goods, it's also a trade in political power and relations. So uh, as soon as you start doing that, you, you create relations that uh, affect your independence, basically. So, and also, um, there's been changes in the arms industry globally that has made it even harder to claim independence through uh, means of arms trading. So, for example, uh, most big arms companies are now globalized. Um, there's been a consolidation where a lot of arms companies, smaller ones, national ones, have gone together in bigger like conglomerates. Uh, for example, as I mentioned, BAE Systems buying Bofors, BAE Systems buying Heiklunds, and there are many examples of this. Uh, so the industry in itself has become globalized and internationalized. Um, the production has also um, gone through changes. So uh, whilst before um, it was possible to, uh, to claim that a certain uh, military system or weapon system was Swedish, uh, today um, the rule is that uh, most bigger weapon systems is made up by parts and components uh, that are international. So there's a, um, a flow of arms components and parts um, through globally. And they are more, more than produced in one country. They are like put together in one country. So for example, um, Jals Gripen fighter jet is often mentioned as like one of the most Swedish uh, weapon systems there is. Uh, but it's actually made up by 50% international parts uh, and components, and it would never be able to produce uh, the Oskilipa fighter jet only in Sweden, only by ourselves or only by Swedish companies. Also, providing arms makes Sweden involved in and therefore like part of armed conflict in various ways. And that is, I think, the opposite of independence or the opposite of, of neutrality also. So sometimes uh, or quite often you hear about um, responsible arms trade. So Sweden, yeah, Sweden is a big arms trader, but uh, we are not like the bad arms traders. We are the responsible arms traders because we have all these kinds of uh, guidelines uh, securing uh, that Swedish arms are not going to the wrong person, used in the wrong ways, etc. And I think there are a lot of um, things to say about this. Um, and you can call this a myth also, the myth of um, being able to control arms trade, because I think there are a lot of aspects um, that lead to this being impossible. And I would say there are two major factors um, that severely challenged the idea of, of, of control when it comes to arms trading, or uh, that severely challenged this idea of responsible arms trade. And uh, the first one is about space, and the other one is about time. And if you look at space, um, this image um, is uh, from, um, it's like a collage of various various situations where Swedish arms have been found, discovered uh, in the wrong hands, so to speak, uh, with people or in regions where it's not exported to or supposed to be. And usually we get this information from, uh, from journalists or through uh, Swedish arms ending up in um, in news uh, reporting from conflict zones, etc. Uh, so, for example, with uh, uh, rebels in Syria, in Libya, uh, with ISIS uh, in Myanmar, which is uh, under a UN embargo, uh, 
and with the al-Shabaab in Somalia, for example. And the risk of arms uh, spreading in this way uh, is a lot bigger when it comes to these kind of arms. Uh, the arms that we see here are called Gustav Grenade Launcher, uh, named after the Swedish king when he was only a small child, uh, and also the AT-4 um, anti-tank weapon. And these uh, are the kind of weapons that are called um, small arms and light weapons. And these these are weapons that you can hold and use one or two persons. Um, and it's, um, they are very easy to kind of give away, steal, forget or lose in any kind of way, bargain with. And whenever they are used in a conflict zone, I'd say the risk is imminent that they, uh, that they are lost in some kind of way. This is just like the nature of armed conflicts and arms are exported to be used in some kind of way and no one would ever buy them if they had if they didn't think that they would ever use them so this is about space and then we have time um, this image is from uh, when the doctors without borders um, hospital was bombed in kunduz in afghanistan in 2005 and according to New York Times, um, this, uh, the bombing was done by U U.S. forces um, and dropped by uh, American uh, soldiers using, um, for example, or, or among others, um, a Beforce cannon, like a Swedish-made cannon, 40 millimeter, probably licensed, produced in the United States during the Second World War. Uh, so this um, major conventional, like big arms weapon systems have a very long lifespan, often um, many decades, can be used for many decades. And also, therefore, it's very hard to like, look in the future and kind of see or try to control who is going to use this uh, weapon system in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years from now, uh, and in what way. Uh, Andrew Smith, who is, um, works at the British organization Campaign Against Arms Trade, he recently said that the lifespan of weapons is much longer than the political situation it's being sold into, and which is very well put, I think. And it's also longer than the political situation in, in Sweden, uh, which, and one example of this is the Swedish democracy criterion. So in 2015, Sweden introduced as the first country in the world a criterion in our guidelines that says that um, if um, that uh, Sweden should um, take into account the democratic status of the buyer country. Uh, so it's word it's very loosely worded. Uh, it, it's not sure yet exactly what it means. But this is kind of what it has produced so far. Uh, these are statistics that are um, put together by the Swedish Peace and Arbitration Society, and it shows uh, the value of Swedish arms export uh, divided um, into countries that are classified as free. These are the green countries, partly free, the yellow countries, and not free, the red countries. And um, we have used definitions and classifications from uh, Freedom House. And as you can see, uh, there's quite a substantial amount of the value of Swedish arms trade going to the kind of undemocratic countries that uh, this like, regulation is, has like, as its goal to, you know, to limit. Um, and last year, uh, close to a third of the Swedish arms trade went to countries that were un unfree or partly unfree. Uh, in 2011, that was uh, a bottom year, more than 50% of arms trade, Swedish arms trade went to these kind of countries. And uh, among the countries that Sweden exports to are, for example, Thailand, Pakistan, Oman, Qatar, Bahrain, Brunei, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Etc. So, so far we haven't seen 
uh, this change in regulation, the democracy criterion has not clearly not uh, led to any um, stop in Sweden uh, supporting undemocratic regimes with weapon systems. Uh, and actually, as we can see, in 2019, it was a lot uh, more than um, the year before this regulation even uh, came into effect. So another uh, question that we usually get is um, why we are opposed to Swedish arms trade. And this is, of course, uh, the uh, our mission to kind of um, to talk about all the time the negative consequences, and um, because a lot of people who are who have to deal with the consequences of Swedish arms trade and arms trade from Western uh, countries in general. Um, they do not have a say or do not have a voice in our debate. Um, so the, this is one aspect of this being so important. Uh, I think the consequences of arms trade are both direct and indirect. Directly, of course, arms and uh, weapon systems, they are um, produced, designed to kill, harm, injure, uh, threaten or force other people, and uh, this is cl uh, clear when you look at some of the slogans of the Swedish arms industry and this, uh, the weapon systems. For example, Jos Gripen had for a while a slogan that was see first, kill first. Uh, so you can never disregard like, the main um, reason behind this industry. Um, access to weapons and military material can prolong and worsen conflicts. And we see this, for example, uh, with the Swedish arms trade to India and Pakistan, who has been in, involved in an armed conflict since, I think, 1947. Sweden has provided both of these countries uh, the arms and military material, with some exception, every year since 1950. And in this way, Sweden has, um, has also been a driving force for this armed conflict to continue. And as we know, armed conflicts are also a major cause, cause of underdevelopment, forced migration, etc. But as important as the direct consequences, I think, are the indirect consequences. Um, and arms trade with undemocratic regimes specifically uh, strengthen the regime's power and, if, um, and contributes to holding uh, demands on freedom and human rights. Uh, for example, uh, uh, then all of a sudden, uh, Swedish policy tried to stand on the other side, like siding with the uh, democracy activists, while at, at the same time kind of continuing to provide these regimes uh, with the force they need in order to stay in power. Arms trade is also, according to Transparency International, accounts for 40% of total corruption in international trade. So this is also something that is a driving force of, for underdevelopment, et cetera. Um, a lot of the, if not all of the Jalskrip and deals that have been uh, during the last, like since Jalskrip was invented basically, have been either a subject of um, a corruption, um, like a, they've been either um, looked at as a corruption or there's been a, a lot of suspicions of corruption. For example, in the, when Jos Gripen was sold to South Africa in the end of the 1990s, there, there's a lot of evidence for corruption in this deal. Also, uh, by countries uh, that prioritize military spending over human security have a lot of uh, negative consequences. Um, and arms are very expensive. Uh, and for countries such as Pakistan, for example, um, this is a, um, a very like a real problem. Um, Pakistan spends 
like 50 times more on its military than on health, even though diarrhea uh, and, uh, and issues connected to lack of clean water is one of the major causes of death and injury in the country. Uh, so this is a clear um, conflict or clash between what is actually security. Um, also, um, Sweden's credibility as a voice demanding sustainable peace, human rights, democracy, uh, as well as I think um, uh, gender equality is severely damaged uh, when we keep supplying arms to uh, the kind of countries that, that actually work in ways that counter Swedish um, interests or ambitions in these areas. And one clear example is the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen. And I, uh, Sweden is, uh, uh, has been very involved in trying to reach a peaceful uh, settlement of this conflict at the same time as we are supplying many of the warring parties in the Saudi-led coalition with arms. And so just to talk a bit about more about the Yemen situation and the Yemen example, um, this is um, uh, just um, a collage of all the kind of uh, media reporting or some of the media reporting on this situation. It's been very much um, uh, in the Swedish debate uh, as well as in the internationally also um, in, in other uh, major exporting countries. So Yemen is uh, one of the major, if not the major, uh, the biggest um, uh, recipient of Swedish uh, foreign aid uh, when it comes to like, humanitarian foreign aid. Um, and according to the United Nations, Yemen is today the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. Um, and uh, the, this war is said to have started in 2015 when a coalition led by, by Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates started bombing the country. According to Save the Children, 85,000 children uh, can have died, can have died um, as a consequence of this crisis. So this is, has to do both with the bombing itself, but also with... Um, a blockade that the Saudi-led coalition has upheld or is upholding uh, in order to stop military material to, from reaching the country, but also it also stops food and medicine uh, that, has, that has contributed to the massive starvation, cholera epidemic, and now we also see um, uh, COVID uh, entering the country. So Sweden has, uh, at the same time as Sweden has this um, major aid, uh, uh, dedication to um, a peaceful resolution of the conflict. At the same time, Sweden has supplied six of the varying parties with military arms and military materials since the start of the war uh, for um, a value of 2.2 billion Swedish crowns. So these, uh, Sweden has um, allowed arms trade to Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates, as well as Qatar, Jordan, Bahrain, Kuwait. So in the film uh, from the arms trade in, uh, arms fair in Abu Dhabi, you could see uh, the Saab, the Swedish company Saab's booth um, and you could also see in one image uh, an airplane like moving very slowly across the sky. And this was uh, the, a weapon system made by Saab called Ari. And this is um, another, um, a more updated version of this system. It's called Global Eye. And this image is from the IDEX arms fair from the Saab booth. Um, and um, when this uh, fair was going on, Sweet Saab was uh, marketing or like very showing off 
uh, this system very much to the United Arab Emirate military forces, as you can see, it's marked with UAE Air Force, etc. Um, this uh, system, Globali, it's a radar and combat control system. Uh, and one year after the Saudi-led coalition started bombing in Yemen, uh, Sweden allowed um, or approved uh, a deal a global eye to the United Arab Emirates um, Armed Forces. And delivery started in April this year, and so far two systems have been uh, delivered. Um, there are clear risks that uh, this system, Global Eye, uh, can be used to uphold this blockade that is a major cause of uh, uh, the devastating situation in Yemen right now. And we know this because there's proof that this system has actually a role to play in the Yemen conflict. This document is, um, uh, was released in last year, in 2019, uh, by um, a journalism, um, by a Disclose, which is a, like a, uh, yeah, um, Yeah, uh, and it's uh, either way. This uh, it was published by Disclose, and it's uh, it was uh, it's a leaked document from the French leaked confidential document uh, that contained a list of um, a military material and arms used in the Yemen conflict. And as you can see on the bottom of this list, we find Saab 2000 area, uh, airborne early warning and control. Uh, and it says it's used in Yemen by the Saudi Arab by Saudi Arabia, and uh, Saudi Arabia bought Ari has bought Ari before, and uh, Ari is uh, the previous version of Global Eye. Um, so there's a real um, there's a clear risk, and um, and the fact that Sweden will supply continue to supply. United Arab Emirates, this kind of system um, will support and strengthen the Saudi-led coalition's um, military um, force in the or means of continuing to wage this war. Um, uh, our demand from SPAS has been all the time uh, from the start of this conflict uh, that all arms trade from Sweden to the very uh, any uh, worrying parties should be stopped immediately without any kind of exceptions or loopholes allowed. Um, so I think I'll stop there and hope for a lot of questions from you. Just uh, thank you so much for inviting me and please um, ask anything that you might think of or raise any issues that you'd like to talk more about or come with any comments that you um, that you have been thinking about. And if you're interested in SPAS, please go to our website. There's a lot of information there. Um, there are ways to get involved and there are ways to support us and there are ways to learn more if you like. Thank you. Amazing lecture. There were many, many informations and I think I need to watch it again at least to get it again, all this information. But we have a couple of questions here from our grateful audience from all over the world and I would like to ask them now to you. The first one is, uh, what can we do to make sure that democratic uh, guidelines are actually followed? Um, if you mean the democracy criterion, I think um, the democracy criterion, it's, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't stop arms trade to undemocratic regimes because it's not supposed to stop arms trade to undemocratic regimes. When it was decided, they consciously chose a wording uh, that means that, uh, that um, for example, these follow-on deliveries that I was talking about, they, are, they continue to be allowed. 
if they are connected to an arms deal that was approved before this new democracy criterion came into force. So this is the first loophole. And that means that follow-on deliveries can continue for decades, 20 years, 30 years, we don't know. So this is one of the first loopholes. And the other loophole is that it's not, um, it's not a clear stop against exporting. Uh, they only say that democracy should be one of the factors that they put into this overall assessment. So that means that if it's important, considered important enough for Swedish, um, for the Swedish defense, for Swedish security policy to export, even though it's to a non-democratic regime, it's, it's allowed to do so. So uh, this means that you can, uh, it's very hard to say that uh, Swedish arms trade is like in contradiction with the democracy criterion because the criterion in itself is very uh, loosely worded. Um, so what we can do is to make this fact known, I think. Uh, my experience is that, um, that if there is information about the situation, then people, uh, then it's much harder to kind of defend uh, the current arms trade policy. And most politicians, uh, um, even though they might um, be approving arms trade in the way that it is today, have can feel very uncomfortable in defending the arms trade as it, as it looks today. Uh, so I think the major thing we can do is continue to spread the word, uh, to share information, to kind of contact politicians, to ask them questions and never let them talk about only, only peace or only defense. Or every time the Sweden talks about peace or uh, women's rights or human rights, uh, we should ask the questions about Swedish arms trade to undemocratic regimes or Swedish arms trade to uh, countries in armed conflict so as to force them to kind of address this major clash of interest uh, that they are now defending. Yeah, I mean, in this case, this lecture can be the first step to make more awareness about this topic. Um, the next question would be, has Sweden changed its approach to arms trade since the 2012 scandal? Have the criteria for which countries can buy arms from Sweden changed since then? I, I think uh, the Saudi scandal made a big impression on Swedish arms trade debates. Uh, my experience from, the, from pe speaking to people or lecturing in, in high schools and universities is that uh, before the Saudi scandal, there was a lot of people who were not aware at all that Sweden was an, an arms exporter. And after the Saudi scandal in 2012, I find that much more people are aware that Sweden is exporting arms, but then they might have questions about um, what this arms trade looks like, what the policy looks like, and et cetera. Uh, so it, it clearly had a, an effect on, uh, on like, the debate uh, and also on journalist knowledge on the issue. But it also contributed to uh, the there was a, a gov an investigation into before the democracy criterion came into place. Uh, that process was started off by the, uh, the so-called Arab Spring, but then it wasn't really kick. It, it didn't really come into force, or they didn't really start working on this issue until after the Saudi um, the Saudi scandal kind of uh, re. Like push this issue on the agenda to make uh, to force the politicians to actually do something about um, investigating this democracy criterion. So it did have a real effect also on uh, on the political process. But then also it made Saudi Arabia into like a um, an, a very clear example. Of course, it was before also, but uh, today it's um, it's harder. It's harder to defend uh, uh, Swedish arms trade to Saudi Arabia than it was before. Can you see uh, any difference between more conservative parties and more left-wing liberal parties in Sweden when you address this topic to them? 
absolutely there's a clear difference um in a way it's uh, the arms trade issue is like uh, an issue that cuts many political parties in half where there's in within the party it can be um one part of the party uh, that clearly supports uh, arms trade that clearly supports the industry with really strong industrial values uh, but then at the same time they can be one part of the uh, of the party that um, uh, focuses more on on solidarity and pushes for those kind of values and social democrats are of course like the major example of this um this uh, like two parties within one party when it comes to this issue and but the most the parties that are most for arms trade it's uh, usually um the conservative Moderatna, as well as Sverige Demokraterna, Sweden Democrats. And then we have like um, the Liberal Party is uh, um, very much against when it comes to certain uh, bio countries, for example, undemocratic regimes, but they can be very for arms trade to democracies and countries that they uh, look upon as not as controversial. Uh, and then the Social Democrats, of course, have this like a very twofold um, attitude towards the arms trade. Um, but it's also the, the party that I would say have most political power in this regard at the moment. Um, and then um, the Green Party and the Left Party are usually the ones that are most, or they are the ones that are most against or arguing most against Swedish arms trade. Does the Swedish uh, approach of feminist, feminist foreign policy also have an impact on the weapon export industry? Good question. This is one of the questions that I always ask uh, any politician or government authority uh, when I talk to them about arms trade. Um, because you would, uh, you would think that it would, right? Um, but um, as far as I've heard, it has had a very, 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 very limited um, effect on Swedish arms trade. Um, it's considered not to be as clear enough of a, a political standpoint. And at the same time as we have feminist foreign policy that is kind of in a way supporting, uh, it's emphasizing Swedish ambitions when it comes to gender equality. We also have a lot of pot political processes that that go in the, the other direction. For example, like emphasis on um, industry cooperation with other um, other arms industries in other countries, uh, like in every defense um, uh, document, you can you can see. Uh, that the need for a Swedish arms industry is emphasized. So these are the kind of political uh, statements that also weigh very heavily uh, when it comes to the actual like, outcome of the Swedish um, arms trade policy and licensing. But I would say that the Swedish uh, foreign policy has is I think it's fantastic that we have it and that it's contribute to a lot of good things on many in many areas, but that the arms trade has been allowed to kind of uh, be left outside of the uh, the analysis. The same gender uh, analysis is clearly not made uh, when it comes to arms trade uh, as it as it is being made in other policy areas. A following up question kind of on that would be, are the following on deliveries based on uh, speculation on ongoing instabilities, conflicts, or are they just purely economic? I'm not sure I understand the questions really, but I think it's uh, the follow on delivery classification. It's, it's motivated by the arms industry's um, need or want to to um, um, provide stability to the buyer countries. So 
it, arms trade is not like you say you have a good and you have some goods and then you sell it to someone else and that's it uh, you you can kind of it's that's yes, it's more like um how do you say it's a it's a very long term commitment where um like technical support and continuous um uh, deliveries of various things is often a very big part of the contracts. So uh, once you have sold something, um, the deal in itself can usually continues for a very long time. Uh, and the arms trade, and the arms industry, and arms companies want to be able to say that uh, whatever happens in your countries, uh, we will still keep providing um, this system for you. Uh, and that has led to what I think is ex extreme situations where Sweden has continued to provide arms despite um, um, like a military coup in the country, uh, despite uh, very big changes in Swedish arms trade policy or very big changes in the country, like the, the buyer country being involved in an armed conflict, for example. Uh, so this is this is something that, uh, that clearly... Um, is in order to support the arms industry uh, on and, and lessening um, severely Sweden's uh, possibilities for export control or, or 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 affecting like the foreign policy aims in the in the arms in the arms trade regulation like human supporting human rights supporting peace etc. The next question would be, um, what kind of weapons does Sweden produce and uh, export mainly? Um, there is a very broad, uh, very, like it's very broad industry, as I said. So uh, mainly it depends on if you look at value, if you look at, yeah, um, the Swedish arms industry, it, it provides a lot of different things. And so everything from fi like big fighter jets uh, to radar combat control systems, to training systems, um, to technical support, to ammunition, artillery, like bombs, grenades, cannons, uh, fighter, uh, like war ships, uh, submarines. Uh, yeah. Um, like the, the only like the one part the one kind of weapon category that we do not sell uh, is like the, the small arms kind of handheld weapons like um, like pistols and those kind of weapons. Sweden does not have a lot of production in that area, uh, but there is also a, um, exports of uh, raw material such as like armored plates. Um, that kind of things that uh, that is used in other countries in order to produce um, this kind of military material. Since you said that uh, Sweden major army producers are owned from British companies, will Brexit have an impact on that? Um, I think. Um, from, I think my question, will, my answer would be, I don't really know. And I don't, I'm not sure that anyone really sits on the answer there. I know it's being discussed how Brexit affects, for example, uh, uh, the British like arms trade regulation, because uh, the UK is, um, um, has been part of the EU common position. And, and now it, it kind of like is not a part of that situation anymore. I, I'm not really sure. I'd have to look into it more. But whoever asked the question can email me and I'll try to find out if they want. And uh, then is the next question. Is it possible to read the assessment when an export decision is made? Uh, I would... I would love to say that it's possible, but I would say that it's un impossible. This is one of the things that we are continuously trying to do. Uh, like, for example, 
uh, what uh, what are the what is the assessment that is behind Sweden continuously providing Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates etc with arms despite the Yemen conflict? I would love to see what kind of uh, um, assessment that was made there because I don't understand it. And uh, what is, for example, why did Sweden start selling? arms to the Philippines, despite the situation regarding human rights, et cetera, armed conflicts uh, in the country. It's another thing that I would love to see. But all of these kinds, of, all this information is covered by um, secrecy, uh, both in terms of like uh, defense uh, secrecy, as well as industry secrecy. So if you would ask for these kind of documents, you would get them all like blacked out. It would basically no information, which is one of the ma like the major problems in trying to discuss this in a democratic way and also trying to raise awareness of this issue. You are constantly get guessing uh, what's going on. Yeah, thank you very much for. Uh your lecture and I'm really happy that we were able to make this arrangement even when it's a bit unfortunate that you can't be here due to the corona situation but I'm really happy that we could arrange this and I'm really happy that we could have this lecture and also a special thanks to the amnesty group who helped me and all the others advertising it all around Umeo and all over Facebook and all over social media ch ch uh, channels and uh, very much thankful for Stefan who made the technology happening that we could stream here live on YouTube. And I'm really, really thankful to you, Linda, that we could hear so much about weapon export in Sweden. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.